Hi guys, welcome to today's MCQ discussion, MCQ discussion number seven. Let's get started. So the first question, a 27 year old male presents to the ER following a history of fall from his bike. He sustained injuries to his head and right upper limb. Patient gives a history of loss of consciousness and confusion for a few minutes after the fall. A CT brain was ordered for and the patient lost his consciousness again while being shifted for the scan. CT brain revealed the presence of an intracranial bleed. Which of the following is it most likely to be? So the options A. Subarachnoid hemorrhage B. Subdural hemorrhage C. Epidural hemorrhage and D. Intraparenchymal hemorrhage So stop, think for a few minutes and then we'll answer together. Okay, so what all do we have to note from this long history given here? So firstly, there is some history of RTA. Secondly, there is some history of trauma to the head. So, so the first thing which I feel is important is first there is some trauma to the head followed by a temporary period of loss of consciousness and then he regained his consciousness completely came to the hospital and in the hospital again he had a loss of consciousness so you see a pattern here of head trauma followed by temporary loss of consciousness regaining of that loss of consciousness or regaining of consciousness and loss of consciousness again so this is classical of something called a lucid interval okay so this is a classical history for a lucid interval in which the patient has some trauma to his head, has a small bout of lost consciousness, then regains his consciousness completely. So he will become completely consciousness, conscious and alert and then loses his consciousness again. So classical history of lucid interval. So where all do you see lucid intervals? You see it in EDH and it is classical of EDH or extradural or epidural hemorrhage and rarely in SDH or in sometimes in SDH. So here the question is, where is it most likely seen? So the answer is C, epidural or extradural hemorrhage. So remember, lucid intervals are classical of extradural hemorrhage. So both EDH and SDH are very high yield topics. So we'll talk about them in some detail. So uh, in brief about intracranial bleeds, to understand intracranial bleeds better, we need to understand the layers present in the skull and the cranium in general better. So first, let's start with the skull below which you have the dura, below which you have the arachnoid, below which you have the pia, below which you have the brain tissue. So these are all the layers you have to cover. So let's start with the skull. So you have the skull above and dura below and the space between the skull and the dura is called the epidural space. The space between the dura and the arachnoid is called the subdural space. The space between the arachnoid and the pia is called the subarachnoid space. And the any bleeding which happens within the cells of the brain is called an intraparenchymal hemorrhage. So in brief, this is about the intracranial bleeds. So in this, since we don't want to delve too much into detail, we can discuss this topic sometime later. We will limit our discussion to EDH. So here you can see we have the skull and we have the this white layer you see is the dura and the blood is collecting between the skull and the dura. So where all do you see EDH? The most common site or most common condition where you see EDH is in a temporal bone injury due to middle meningeal artery bleeding. So the most common artery that bleeds in EDH is the middle meningeal artery. The most common skull bone that is fractured leading to EDH is your temporal bone. Okay, so here the picture shows temporal bone itself. And the most common site where this damage can lead to an EDH is called the terion and that's a meeting point of four bones on the lateral aspect of the skull. So remember temporal bone, middle meningeal artery and Tyrion, it's spelled with a P. Okay, so that was the important points about EDH, and we already told it presents with headache, history of trauma, headache, and also this classical lucid interval. I have added this, these two images below. They are two CT scan images, and this is probably the most high yield thing I have ever discussed in the MCQ discussion series so far. So, it is the classical shape or the classical radiological appearance of these hemorrhages. So the first one I'm going to discuss about is this. So here you see the bleed having a classical lens shape, lentiform shape or a lemon like shape. So it's, this looks like your lens, right? So this is a classical CT scan showing an extra dural hemorrhage. Now you can just compare this drawing from Netters with this radiological scan and you can see they look similar. So a lentiform shaped or a lemon shaped uh, so, uh, bleed like this is classical of an extra dural hemorrhage and the minute you see this photo extra dural hemorrhage should come into your mind very high yield concept the next thing is the second photo which actually represents a subdural hemorrhage okay so here we have a classical picture for an sdh 
and you can see it is more of a crescent shaped bleed okay crescent shaped or if you want to remember in fruit terms it is banana shaped so a crescent shaped bleed or a banana shaped bleed which looks like you know it's just taking the shape of the skull is an subdural hemorrhage so you differentiating these are very important again very high yield topic so crescent shaped or banana shaped sdh lemon shaped or lens shaped is edh okay. let's go to the next question okay so the second question we'll talk about sorry for the writing let's just clear it yeah so the second question we'll talk about a child presented with a history of ingestion of a plant shown in the image and developed midriasis tachycardia dry mouth warm skin and delirium which of the following uh drugs could be responsible for these symptoms so pause read the question think about it yeah so here we have let's look at the features midriasis midriasis tachycardia dry mouth warm skin and delirium so when you see midriasis tachycardia dry mouth and warm skin you are thinking it's more of a sympathetic or sympathomimetic kind of condition right so it's it's basically a condition where there is more sympathetic activity or or rather less parasympathetic activity because as we discussed in yesterday's video also and i'll tell you briefly today parasympathetic is a rest and digest state so all the secretions like salivation lacrimation all of those things will be more whereas your sympathetic state is a uh, fight or flight situation so you have you know widened eyes for better view so you have midriasis and you have reduced secretions reduced bowel bladder activity all of that is part of a sympathetic state we can discuss ans in further detail later but if you look at these symptoms it looks like it's more of a sympathetic or a reduced parasympathetic state so among the options uh, if you went through the options among the options a could be the answer and b also could be the answer so it could be an anticholinergic or it could be an sympathomimetic here is where the toxicology or the picture comes into play so remember this plant is nothing but your atropine or uh, atropa belladonna okay so that is the plant from where we uh, obtain atropine so this is your atropa belladonna plant pink flower a purple flower classical atropa belladonna plant so the drug is obviously atropine and atropine is an anticholinergic agent so the answer is a anticholinergic agent there is one more reason why we can pick anticholinergic over sympathomimetic even if the diagram was not given and that is the history of dry mouth warm skin and delirium so remember when a sympathomimetic is taken the more classical features are anxiety tachycardia and you know it's those features whereas in if an anticholinergic overdose is seen there is some altered state of consciousness that is very important delirium and dry mouth or xerostomia is also classical of an anticholinergic agent so even without the picture even without knowing toxicology just from the pharmacological aspect we can remember delirium or altered consciousness and xerostomia are more pointing towards an anticholinergic drug rather than a sympathomimetic drug so the answer is a anticholinergic drug and the drug here is atropa belladonna small story to help you remember atropa belladonna causes midriasis so Firstly, midriasis means dilated pupil. So midriasis has the word D in it, which is really strong. So mid for dilated. So midriasis for dilated pupil. So in the past, uh, atropine in the Roman era was used by women to dilate their eyes. So atropine was used even back then to dilate their eyes. And as it was believed, women with bigger eyes look more beautiful. So they used to apply a bit of this uh, in their eyes. so that the pupil appears to be dilated and they are assumed to be more beautiful so that is why the name atropa belladonna or why this plant is named belladonna belladonna means beautiful woman so women used to use this to dilate their eyes so that they look better and that's how the name atropa belladonna came up so you can re always remember with the story that atropine causes midriasis or dilatation of the eyes next question another high yield question The following condition is seen in which stage of WHO classification of vitamin A deficiency? Okay, so A X one A, B X one B, C X three A, and D X three B. Two seconds. Pause. Try to answer. Yeah. So this, you would have seen this image in many places. You would have seen this even in your real life in clinics, wherever foamy kind of whitish, yellowish, foamy uh, uh, region seen in the conjunctiva. And this is a classical. by tot 
spot okay this is a classical bite out spot and we all know bite out spots are seen in x1b okay so the answer is b x1b now let's talk about this classification because it's important high yield most of you know it but we'll just run through it quickly so always remember there are one two and three grades and you have three alphabets n f and s so i used to remember it as nfs like need for speed so nfs are the alphabets in the grading and one two and three are the grades so all you have to remember is one grade one or stage one is associated with the kanching taiva and everything else is associated with the cornea so only grade one is associated with kanching taiva everything else is associated with the cornea of course other than f which is associated with the f for fundus so f is associated with the fundus so one and f are not associated with cornea whereas two three and s are associated with the cornea so let's look at it now so x1a is conjunctival xerosis x1b is bite out spot x2 is i told you everything is cornea now so x2 is corneal xerosis so first you have dryness and then you have ulceration x3 is associated with corneal ulceration involving one third or less and x3b is involving one half or more of the cornea so just remember if it involves more than one third then it's x3b if it involves less than one third of the cornea it is x3a xs is corneal scarring xf is fundus changes so fundus changes are the last to happen and nyctalopia is the first sign of vitamin a deficiency nyctalopia is night blindness so xn or night blindness is the first sign followed by dryness of the conjunctiva then your bite out spot so remember 1b is bite out spots i used to remember as b i t o t right so this is like b1 so 1b so 1b or b for bite out so 1b bite out spots and two onwards cornea starts so first cornea gets dry so x2 corneal xerosis next cornea starts scarring uh, sorry next cornea starts developing an ulcer so first dryness it develops a small ulcer so x3a less than one third then the ulcer gets larger so x3b more than one third and then the ulcer star starts scarring which is permanent so xs is scarring and then lastly you have fundal changes so remember first is night blindness then conjunctival changes that is x ones and x2 and 3 together are corneal dryness followed by uh, ulceration followed by scarring xs and last xf fundus changes so the last question for today is all of the following are uses of prazosin except okay a peripheral vascular disease b pheochromocytoma c snake bite and d bph few seconds yeah so when you get a question like this and you will definitely get questions like this these are uh, especially from pharmacology this is the most common type of question that comes what is the use of the drug except or even what is the use of this drug so firstly when you see a question like this identify what the drug is so we know prazosin is an alpha 1 selective blocker so again you see how important ans is in 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 these exams so it's an alpha 1 selective blocker or alpha blocker so it prevents uh it prevents the sympathetic activity especially of epinephrine so prevents the sympathetic activity so where do we frequently use prazosin or what's one of the main use of prazosin since it's alpha 1 selective we know the alpha 1 sympathetic receptors are usually seen in the blood vessels and when your epinephrine or norepinephrine bind to these alpha 1 receptors it causes vasoconstriction okay so these drugs will cause will prevent this binding and therefore will prevent vasoconstriction so that's what you have to know these drugs prevent vasoconstriction by blocking the alpha 1 receptor so now we'll go through the options and see if it's of any use in these options so first option is a peripheral vascular disease so in peripheral vascular disease we know there is narrowing and reduced blood flow to a certain part of the body usually the lower limbs in men or sometimes even in the upper limbs so basically peripheral vascular disease is reduced blood flow so do we benefit from having dilatation of blood or preventing constriction of blood vessels so definitely yes we do benefit so it can be used in peripheral vascular disease next pheochromocytoma so we know pheochromocytoma is where there is excess uh, 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 excess production of catecholamines are there so this blocks the action of catecholamine catecholamine so yes it can be useful in pheochromocytoma c snake bite uh, we don't know if it could be useful so we'll keep that aside and lastly bph so we know prazosin is one of the drugs frequently used in bph alpha 1 selective blockers are used in bph because they help in uh, preventing urinary retention and allow urinary outflow remember tamsulosin is the drug which is frequently used tamsulosin 
which is again in the same group as prazosin so yes prazosin can benefit in bph so the answer should be snake bite so yes the answer is c snake bite and we have done this by ruling out so such questions always look and see if the use of that drug can be applied to the disease lastly uh, why did i uh, include snake bite as one of the options remember prazosin is used in the management of a scorpion sting not a snake bite so it's not used in snake bite but it is used in the management of scorpion stings and scorpion poisoning it helps prevent the development of pulmonary edema in scorpion stings so this is a weird use of prazosin scorpion sting so you can remember that other than these obvious uses it's also used in scorpion bite or scorpion sting okay so that's it for today we've stuck to time thank you